So without further delay, let me introduce you our panelists. Soumya. Soumya, Vidya and Surbhi. Surbhi is our moderator. Soumya and Vidya are our panelists. Soumya is a director of product management and design at Zemeso. Zemeso offers innovative as a service to their clients. In their current role, she is account accountable for product managers and designers. She is also responsible for delivering the pre-seed in initiatives where her team works along the entrepreneurs to take the idea of market by applying design thinking. Jobs to be done by and other cutting edge framework technologies. She started her career as a developer and learned product and design out of fashion. A second panelist is Vidya. Vidya is a co-founder of CodeWave.com, heads design thinking, and has helped hundreds of business innovatively solve problems in a human-centric way. As an electrical engineer from NIT Jaipur, Vidya started her career as a Java programmer and went on to exploring various business product design roles in the IT industry. She started her entrepreneurial journey in 2013 along with her partner in life, Abhijit, and on her journey impacted thousands of business through her work and won several prestigious recognitions and awards. She is a future 50 honoree by Pro Project Management Institute. Codewave is a clutch club winner for top companies in 2019. 2021 and 22. And now to take the session forward, I'd like to introduce you to the moderator of the session, Surbhi Gupta. Surbhi has 17 plus years of experience in building products at companies like Facebook, Tesla, Intrude, Oracle, as well as early and mid stage startups. Her background includes hosting a radio show, teaching at a product school, and guest lecturing at NYU Stern for a tech MBA program. Her passion lies in intersection of human behavior and technology. She enjoys building products and positivity influence people's behavior on society scale and enjoys technical others how to how to do the same. Her focus approaches up allows her to thrive in working in innovation solutions. In addition, she actively mentors startups and aspiring entrepreneurs through programs like Plug and Play Ventures. She is also a mentor on multiple platforms to help individuals grow their PM careers. Now, Hello, now I will... Hi. Hi, Surbhi. Now I would like to hand over the session to you. Sure. Thanks, Pragya. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, excited to be hosting today's session. Hey, Vidya. Hey, everyone. Hi, Surbhi. Hi. So since you're here, I think let's start up with a warm-up question. You have been in product design. I would love to know, like, how did you start this career? What motivated you? I think my journey is somewhat similar to Samya's. Um, I started off my career as a Java developer. Um, and one thing I was always fascinated about was the big picture, right? I would love to explain anything I'm doing in the simplest possible way. But when I was coding, I, I didn't get the big, big, big picture. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who I was doing it for, even, even the why, right? So that sort of made me explore different roles. So very soon I moved from coding to uh, technical sales and support. And then from there, I went on to becoming a business analyst. So I, I tried choosing roles where I'm closer to the vision. And I knew the why. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how I landed on a product management role. And, and, and then after product management, it was entrepreneurship. 
Oh, so you have been a product manager turned designer. That's super interesting. I've never actually met anybody uh, that has some background like that. It's sometimes opposite, like, okay, designer turned into management, product management path. So I would love to know what are like um, the main challenges that you encountered and yeah, let's, let's pause there and would love to hear that. I think product management itself is a very, um, you know, multidisciplinary function, right? Like you have to wear many hats. You have to think like an entrepreneur. Uh, you can't say I'm a product manager, so I won't do wireframes. So, you know, there's somebody else for visual design. So, I mean, I was always wearing multiple hats. Um, I think main challenge is to stay focused on what the user wants. Uh, and also anchor everyone in the business team on what we want to achieve as a business. Um, aligning everyone towards the KPIs and while designing something that is delightful for users. I think that's the challenging and the amazing part of being a product manager. Okay, over to Soumya. I would love to hear about you as well. What have been the biggest motivators and challenges in the role? Um, I think uh, working at Zemoso um, and offering innovation as a service, I was pushed into the uncomfortable but interesting zone of understanding the why behind the product, understanding um, the rationale and how do you take your idea and how do you roll it out into you know a product market fit, something that hits the market fit. And um, as a part of that, picked up design thinking conducted some sessions, seen the power of design thinking, not just for product design, but service design as well across board. And that brought me through to an interesting journey of partnering with entrepreneurs in both product and design and learned, uh, I think broke a few teeth um, and then kind of probably <laughs> learned some lessons on how to take that forward. Okay, that sounds interesting. So I would love to go deeper. Like, can you share an example any of you can take where you had to uh, like really do a lot of, like we always do a lot of trade-offs that where it was more like you have to do a design trade-off and how can, you know, listeners, uh, our, our listeners can learn from them any any such story which can give an example so that people can have a takeaway and how, like if you had a challenge, how you navigated through it, and which can be which can have a general application yeah yeah absolutely i think a uh, couple of things i think one was when we were trying to work with deep tech products like you're doing a security or privacy tech product um, i think the challenges were always understanding the domain in depth to be able to partner on the why uh, so doing a lot of heavy research and using structured frameworks like jobs to be done using structured frameworks or even methodologies that are there in design thinking really helped um, approach it uh, in a structured way, articulate it, bring it up, have conversations in a structured way to, uh, uh, with stakeholders. Um, and then once you have that and you're able to surface up a lot of brilliant ideas, there's too much to chew and then prioritization is always a problem. And especially in the innovation time, I think the first time it's just too much to chew for everyone. At that point of time, being able to use a product prioritization, um, any framework, sometimes we use impact effort metrics, sometimes we see you know, value proposition, which one is the biggest pain for the customer. Um, any of those frameworks to be able to put a tactical solution, put a strategic solution, and show the path ahead from the tactical solution to the strategic solution for the entrepreneur that no, we're not, we're not ignoring it, we, we'll get it for you. right? But the timeline that we have and how do we do the trade-off of being able to get you to market quickly, get, get you to show something to your stakeholders, get them to try your product. So a lot of product prioritization frameworks help, uh, help that, uh, you know, bring that trade-off and align with them in the journey. Yeah, that's absolutely. I thought that was the role of product managers. Even designers have to do so much. I didn't know. I am going to empathize more with the design team now. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Soumya. Would you like to share maybe more from a design perspective? Yeah. Uh, because you have been in both the roles. So how it differs in the design perspective? So I could take an example of the government of Bangalore. One of the projects I did was uh, for BBMP, uh, for the Bangalore government. Um, so people in Bangalore know of BBMP as a garbage collection service. <laughs> Sadly, but... Actually, BBMP does a lot more number of services for citizens 
from offering prop, uh, birth certificate, allowing them to do property taxes, death certificate, and a whole lot of things. So then we, the challenge was for us as designers to change the perception uh, people had about BBMP and, uh, you know, and also make BBMP get more conversational with citizens, right? Like the moment citizens think of speaking to the government or getting some stuff done, right? They think about forms and these forms were buried into these government websites and these were big websites with 400 pages and nobody knew what would happen when they submitted a form. And, and, and uh, you know, on the other hand, when we intervened, we said, okay, how about a chat GPT like conversational experience for people, right? And there are people using your website from ages 15 to 65 and, you know, why not make it simple and conversational for them. It should, mm -hmm. it should feel like a breeze. So that, you know, bringing that conversational UX uh, to the whole Citizen Connect portal was, um, you know, a great challenge for us to solve. And even the government team loved it. Um, in fact, the way they looked at themselves after we launched the app uh, was that, you know, they, they felt that they were more agile, they were more responsive, uh, and they were not really the traditional team uh, working on forms and paper documents. Yeah, this sounds really interesting. I feel like I know I want to know more. So any biggest um, like lessons or anything that you did that changed the whole story in partic this particular instance? I think the lesson here is uh, we have to be open for radical change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is not a marginally improving the solution but you'll have to radically change the way you look at the business. Uh, you look at people and, and uh, you create a whole different experience for people. So I think that was a big takeaway for us. Yeah, and that sounds really, really interesting and cool project to work for. So that takes me to the next question, which is more like, what are the main skills that you said, like, yeah, there is like some marginal changes and then incremental changes. And Tomia, you can also show, I mean, I would open it, to for, open it for both of you. Like, what are the main skills that successful designers should have and somebody who wants to transition to like not only an IEC but also build a team? I think like I said if you have an entrepreneurial spirit right and, and I, I see five C's which is mm -hmm. curiosity, creativity, clarity, courage and collaboration. If you wear these five C's into any meeting uh, I think you can generally be curious about solving problems, be creative about imagining solutions, uh, strive to seek that clarity, bring critical thinking, uh, have the courage to question opinions, biases, and also be collaborative in the process, right? Like build on top of everyone's ideas. I think these are some foundational skills. And on top of it, of course, uh, learning design thinking, learning systems thinking, uh, learning to draw ideas and put ideas into motion, uh, visual thinking, um, behavioral design and psychology of human behavior, gamification. I think a lot of these different things would definitely add to your toolkit. Yeah, I love the C's framework. I have my own, so uh, hats on, on, on to 5C framework. So I, mean, I think you unmuted in between. Would you like to give another C here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think critical thinking, um, really. Um, in the era of generative AI now, where a lot of, I think, ideas are getting seeded, you're able to probably put something together much more faster. Uh, being able to bring in the element of being thinking through, not just surfacing up what you have brought up and be able to, uh, I think collaboratively build it. I think Vidya kind of nailed a whole bunch of things there uh, because design thinking and innovation is not like one person. It's not, I have always told my designers, you know, no designer is an island. You're not designing this in your own world where, you know, you're, this is not your practice exercise. So really have to bring it out iteratively align with stakeholders. Um, co-create, co-creation is pretty much is the key for me there, right? And if you're able to co-create um, with the, all the stakeholders and bring that out, uh, that will be the best that you can do. Totally. That brings me to another uh, like skill, which I often face, like designers need a deep heads down time, right? So how do you advise people to balance it out with a lot of like stakeholder meetings and especially we as PMs call designers all the time, let's brainstorm this. <laughs> so how do you, how do you advise others to protect? And uh, my next question is going to be very, very product focused, but um, that, but let's, let's hear this thought. 
I think um, I would prefer having a weekly rhythm set up with uh, stakeholders involved in designing the solution. Uh, sometimes we also bring the users into the creation process. Um, so it's more agile and you know, we take one sprint at a time and reflect a lot on the journey, right? Like, and and, and we, the reflection process is very important as we build something incrementally every week. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, yeah, definitely uh, schedule your meetings in advance and then kind of use the time management techniques like time blocking technique. The, this this 12 to 2, 12 to 3, right? I'm going to But what if, this. let's say, I'll tell you a personal story. Sorry, I interrupted you. Sometimes, yeah, no you know, PMs are the bad cops or any other stakeholders could be the one. But yeah, I'm just putting it on myself. <laughs> Where you have something like, let's say something critical, right? And you have a plan and you have meaning set, but something comes up like a high priority thing and you have to do like handle that. So that's when you are like as another stakeholder prompted to take over like other people's calendar and you have to sometimes really go. So sometimes these things are great, but they don't work. So as designers, like, is it like, I'm just wondering like, how how do you balance that like okay because you guys need real deep context as well and i think i like to involve um key stakeholders early on because then the partnership gets better rather than just like oh this is what i want and you go and build and working in silos rather than involving in why are we building so having of course that balance that not calling in every like every stakeholder in every meeting but still optimizing and that's a lot of work on our side like I don't think anybody just schedules meeting uh, randomly but after a lot of thinking so how do you then um, navigate like would you think a designer is better like give them digital knowledge or it's better that involve them in actually why wise of the thing and then have some heads down time um I think uh, so I would give prioritization frameworks to my designers also saying use Eisenhower metrics, right? And you ask the question to someone who's pulling you into a meeting saying, is it urgent, right? Is it critical? Is it important? I'm in the middle of this task. And you're able to ask, you don't have to decline a meeting. You can ask questions and figure out if that can be done at an alternate time. Um, and so far, I think that kind of at least uh, wasn't too hard right so you're at least surfacing up saying it creativity is not like something I can pick up this thread that's coming right now and then pick it up one hour later line of code that I'm picking up later kinds so it did help Surbi to have you know both the mm -hmm. time management time blocking and being able to say is it urgent is it and sometimes your mentees are probably pinging you and have open office hours ping me anytime between four to five when I'm available to respond to you. But beyond that, the rest of the time is mine, right? So those are some of the techniques that really help. Another friendly tool uh, is something I use called the social contract. It's a more democratic way of uh, mm -hmm. letting the entire group uh, decide on how frequently we'll meet, uh, what will we do. And in case we're not able to achieve what we planned, what will be the consequence? So it's a more friendly way of setting up a social contract. It's it's just a set of behaviors we can expect from each other. So so nobody has to go and follow up on, hey, please come, please do this. Okay, that sounds like a fun. I know designers always have some interesting, cool ideas. <laughs> so asking, so tell me, what's your dream product team? Like, um, and we'll see like, okay, what are the real life? But let's start like from there. What would be like, what would you need from them to be really successful in your role? Samia, you want to go? Yeah, sure, Vidya. I think for me, it's like a team of people with growth mindset, um, mm -hmm. excellent learnability, right? And someone who is always willing to challenge the assumptions. I mean, I it was a fact yesterday, but is it really a fact today? Someone who's able to, you know, challenge that facts as of yesterday. So I think those three are the characteristics that would make a dream product and design team for me. And you can really share in this open forum any things that should not, like how can, um, actually I should, let's hear Vidya's thoughts also, but in the meanwhile, I'll give you the next question, which is more like any suggestions you would like to give to these other XFN that how can they hear, absorb, and you know work effectively with design. But yeah, over to Vidya for this one. 
Oh, well, my dream team, I think, uh, would be uh, a cross-functional team uh, with people wearing multiple hats, thinking entrepreneurially, um, you know, and working closely with uh, users. Um, yeah, I think... Um, Any Liz nightmares in the dream that you don't want? <laughs> Ego, no ego. <laughs> Please keep your ego <laughs> outside. And 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 uh, some a team that's great at listening and collaboration. And and uh, diversity is key. If we can tolerate uh, a diverse range of opinions and you know um, accept other perspectives and broaden the perspective, I think that like uh, Somya also mentioned, uh, humility uh, is key. So one question, let's say it's a very, very collaborative team, but they keep um, giving a lot of feedback and constantly trading the design cycle. Is it something that is okay with designers? I'm just asking, you know, because my designers would never tell me that. So I'm asking in this forum, taking advantage, how how do you react? Like If it's for right reasons, of course, not like, oh, I don't like this, red to pink, not like that. But really, if they give you the rationale behind that. Yeah, see, uh, at, the, uh, at the initial stages of the project, uh, we do something called the success criteria. We set mm -hmm. the success criteria for the whole effort. Absolutely. Right? When do we call our design successful, right? Mm -hmm. So all of us are very clear. We are going to call our design a successful design when these parameters are met. So everyone is steering towards achieving that success criteria, right? So if it means we want more users adopting it, we want more referrals. So we'll make sure the design meet those criteria. So as long as we are aligned on that outcome and we are biased towards taking actions, right? Like I think we're good. Yeah. And the other thing that helped me is taking the yes and, right? The design thinking principle, absorb what is coming your way and mm -hmm. probably add to it and see how can I take that suggestion and make it better. You're becoming a partner in the game for them, right? And uh, the ESN technique works wonders. Okay. Uh, I think this is a good gateway to my other question, which I'd asked earlier, like what are the things that you would like to share with broader XFN to help design to work more effectively? I would uh, say that Take a course that you deeply care for and go from idea to prototype. Get hands on mm -hmm. with, you know, solving a real world problem and um, create a design prototype. I think the best way to learn design is by doing um, and, and trying and making mistakes and listening to users and going back and improving. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think immersive learning, uh, like Vidya said, deliberate practice, you take a product you take any product that you really like, break it down and understand, okay, they have used a primary button here. They've used a secondary button here. Why would they have used it? Um, and, uh, you know, use that to connect the dots and then use all of that knowledge and observation, tie it down to what you've already learned theoretically, and then use it in actually building something. And like Vidya said, brilliant again, something that you care about passion. So it's not like, oh, I am redoing Swiggy. So it's very casual, but something that you're passionate about, I think adds a lot, a lot of value. So it's like design tear down, like how we do product tear downs. Uh, that's the advice I give usually to my mentees as well to develop their product sense. Okay, I was asking a little different question, which was more like, let's say you are in a product team with all the experience, maybe engineering, data science, product management, and you name it, like there could be different depending on your setup. So any tips that you would like to give to these XFN who like me, who have all years out today to hear, like what are the pain points of design? How can we make your life easier? How should we change or adapt our working style that can really help design designers yeah i think if everyone can wear a design thinker's hat which means if you can all empathize with the end user as much as a ux designer does um, i think that's that would be of great help because all of us would be then aligned on solving that human problem right like there's we are all aligned on that persona. We are all aligned on that intention. So we really try hard to understand the user persona, but usually the challenges I have seen is like I have to keep different type of designers again. Sometimes we are building something totally innovative, never done before. Then uh, of course we have to 
design based on users mental models we can't change it drastically because then maybe it's the best design but it's not helpful for people they have to learn and that's not good then but the challenge is sometimes even if it's simple design but never done before like how it's technically feasible versus like design is awesome but it adds to too much of effort so keeping the designers focused also like this is the problem at hand yeah this is something that is awesome but we need to again have that mvp mlp thinking so how like that's my challenge sometimes that okay like yeah it's great that you are exploring all of these things but we need to build something out as well so what's your take on that Samia you want to go yeah sure I think uh, definitely design thinking hat you're not just end user but other users also stakeholders right entrepreneur is a stakeholder you have the design team and other approach is for me is also doing a T-scale. So you have the depth of being a designer, but you have to understand a little bit about feasibility. You will have to understand a little bit of product. You have to understand a little bit of marketing or, you know, whatever angle to be able to design effectively. So you're able to see the other perspectives and you're able to understand and marry it together to what you need, what your depth is. Right. have conversations early on and you someone said hey i want to show this super fancy chart it really looks good and you you really like it and you're having a conversation with your developer saying which library are you using by the way for the charts and is this a possibility for you right so really being able to just have enough knowledge across board along with your depth helps yeah i would also add that uh, oftentimes designers chase perfection there's mm -hmm. nothing called perfection. <laughs> if you get stuck with the idea of, oh, I, I haven't yet reached that perfect design, it's never going to mm -hmm. happen. So uh, I would say get dirty, prototype, go launch, work with the business team and, and look what users are doing, do analytics and, you know, study and then do something more dirty and... <laughs> I really love that Vidya because that's what I want. Sometimes be scrappy and yeah, we will learn in the process. We don't have to be perfect in on day one or day zero. Yeah, totally agree to that. Any advice to like, how is the design career? Like, how do you grow from like in the progress? Like, how do you grow from IC to people's manager and beyond? Because in products, it's very different. I have honestly never paid that much attention how designers lead their career. So um, would love to, you know, maybe share that with the audience here. How to grow further in career and what are the different paths? Well, I have not had a traditional corporate uh, mm -hmm. ladder uh, in my product and design career as such. So I was a product manager and then I jumped into entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, I, I was a design thinker. I was also designing uh, solutions. So there's no one linear path uh, to Absolutely. create product or design career. Um, you can start with solving problems for the society that you deeply care about. Um, you can learn some visual design skills and, you know, start putting your ideas into motion. And I think that would help more than any other theoretical learning. How about you, Samia? What do you advise um, our audience? I see it as a triangle. So you start at the UI, visual design elements, typography, color, layout. Am I using them effectively? to the next part of the triangle, which is UX, understanding users, being able to heuristically tell, you know, how do you optimize their journey? Then the third triangle being the product, which domain does it solve the problem to? What is the context? What's going on? What is the problem? And all of that a little bit more product depth. And once you kind of move from UI designer, UX designer, product designer, I think kind of opens up opportunities for at least in my team, right? Design lead, design managers is one stream that opens up. The other stream that opens up is now you're really a good product designer and you're able to build that T-skill in product as well. And product management kind of opens up from there. That sounds interesting. Um, yeah, I think it is useful for some of our listeners as well. And audience, if you have any question, please feel free to share. I do have one uh, more thing here to ask, which is like, in what are the trends that you see in the future? And what are the role of like products like ChatGPT, AI in design, how it's going to change a designer's um, like life? Is it going to make it easier? Or is it going to take the job away? <laughs> I think I would love to maybe share that with the audience. Um. 
I think, see, from a UX design perspective, still um, nothing can beat a human to human listening to each other, sensing needs that people are um, not vocal about um, and sensing those fears, aspirations, and, you know, um, and UX design still is largely dependent on humans. Uh, the UI, probably the UI designs, graphic designs, we get a lot of generative AI helping us. So um, I think that's that would be my stance on it. Hey, Soumya, do you want to add to this with your thoughts here? Um, sorry, I, I missed the question. Can you repeat that? Oh, I was asking, like, um, how do you see the future of design? What are the main trends? Yeah. And how yeah, do you absolutely. see um, like AI uh, impacting design? Um, we've been trying to use a little bit of uh, how do we leverage chat GPT in our design thinking sessions, right? How do we leverage the, I mean, any, any tool is a weapon, but you can also use it to make your life easy. So absolutely. Um, and that's been cutting a lot of productive, I mean, productivity is improved with the time that it would take to do something is massively reduced uh, by leveraging it. And I think it's easy to navigate that UI to product designer path because you can really use ChatGPT to be able to do a lot of research for you quickly if you know how to write the right prompts and ask the right questions. Um, other trends that I'm seeing and that we are exploring is conversational UI, right? Our UI is going to become a little bit more conversational than click and point and click interfaces. Um, and from a career point of view, I feel that designers might have to, might have to start understanding a little bit of NLP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do, how do we design conversations? How do conversation flows kind of have to be designed and use of psychology and probably a little bit of literature, English, uh, and uh, those to be able to do that effectively. Yeah, I, I think uh, you've nailed it. So any tips on learning NLP for designers specifically? Because I don't think they want to become masters of NLP, but any suggestions in how you as a designer think it's easier to learn? Like what are the, any suggestions for listeners? Um, I'm a little bit more hands-on there because of my prior engineering experience, mm -hmm. but I would assume that Udemy would have some beginner's courses by now on NLP and that probably would be a good start. Yeah, yeah, I am also uh, with engineering background, so it's I, that's why I was like, okay, let's let's see somebody who is like totally with design mindset how they can learn, but probably depend on these external courses. Hibita, do you have to? Do you have anything to add here? I think nothing. Uh, Samia, okay. Pretty Awesome. I'll take an audience question. Uh, Mukesh is asking in your experience, what are some common challenges that product managers face when trying to incorporate design thinking principles into their work? Yeah. Um, maybe uh, bringing user empathy as part of your sprint practices. Uh, like, you know, you would have your regular design and development sprints going on. Um, how can you bring users into your creation process, right? Um, what if you have user feedback uh, after your sprints, how are you going to bring it to your uh, upcoming sprints? I think that could be one challenge, like managing all stakeholder expectations plus user feedback and integrating that into the delivery uh, process. That could be one challenge I foresee. Yeah. In our case, I think that and also being able to align your stakeholders. Sometimes they say, I don't want to follow this process. I want to get to get me the screens and I want to see it. Why should I follow the process? So you are able to kind of articulate and persuade them on what is the advantage of following this process and um, how really on day five, you're going to get the prototype, but this is a process and give examples from your earlier experience of like, you know, how it helped stakeholders align. I have quite a few case studies where um, my uh, entrepreneur said, oh, we've been on this for six months. We thought we have everything nailed until I went through these five days and I realized, no, I have to follow this process, right? There's so much value add. So I bring up some of those case studies. I bring up some of those examples and say, I know it is painful for you. I know I'm asking you to sketch and you don't like to, um, but it's really the end product is going to be a lot more purposeful yeah, yeah. And Can I'll you share some of the examples here? 
with the audience if they are of course not indeed out <laughs> sure right after i think vidya will finish her chain of thought oh yeah so i did i interrupt uh, I, was, okay. i was just going to add that uh, you have to keep everyone honest in the team challenge opinions it's not about um one opinion versus the other but actually what the user needs so sometimes you'll have to bring the user validation into your sprint so uh, and you know and put it on the table so yeah 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 and uh, sulbi to answer your question i think i had one case study was a bunch of serial entrepreneurs their investors themselves um, sold to salesforce in the past ca in the past mm-hmm. so huge companies right they've come in they said we've spent 6 months we know exactly what we want you just give us a designer and then you give us a bunch of engineers who will just execute um and then we said yes we'll do that and 5 days is our time now right go through a design thinking with us and then we'll get you all of that so they started getting restless day to uh, no not happening i understand my users already i define whatever i'll give you exact requirements just move on now and get things done um but at the end of it after they have seen the sketches they have when we post we kind of they understood that oh this clarity i didn't have this alignment i didn't have with my stakeholders before um they were questions coming across and design thinking does have all stakeholders cross functional so they're bringing questions from engineering you're getting questions from sales and marketing and you know all of these perspectives coming in and you're kind of thinking through more so they've really come out and said what i thought i nailed i didn't um i had no idea and kind of what i thought kind mm-hmm. of pivoted through the design sprint also because of the involvement of this different stakeholders and it really adds value for me and um, they were another set of stakeholders recent design thinking again serial entrepreneurs they came in they said two months we've been at this problem both of us are experienced we know what it is right let's just get to it um i kind of we navigated them yes day 2 you're going to day 4 you're definitely going to get the prototype right so there's no questions asked but here is this do this and they came back on day 4 and they they again gave the feedback saying that well four days prototype and you guys are able to bring in a lot more value in alignment for us so me and my other co-founder we didn't realize that we had differences of opinion and we did, you could help us align very quickly to one vision mm-hmm. and move forward so a couple of case studies where That's design takes awesome. great immense value yeah So, Swami, you're talking about these design sprint, the main, the from the popular book, right? Or the five day sprint process, right? Yes, we take the okay. five day sprint process mm-hmm. and kind of customized it because we've run about fifty such design sprints at Zemo mm-hmm. so far. So, some learnings from that that we iterate and do slightly differently, but eighty percent is from the book. Yeah, yes. it has to depend on the kind of product, the culture, how big is the team, definitely, and the maturity. Yeah, yeah, we also use that. Yeah. So, Sritya, do you were you adding something here? Yeah, I mean, I have many examples of how my customers would come with an assumption, saying, "Okay, I'll take this example of a company that wanted to build uh, a fintech application for rural India." Right. So their assumption was the rural Indians uh, wouldn't use smartphones like urban Indians. So we did. We took them through the design thinking journey, <laughs> and it was completely eye-opening. And they found that. rural indians were playing teen patti they were playing free fire they were playing um, all other games and Which, you know, really that's amazing yeah, even i'm i'm um, enlightened <laughs> they were betting on dream 11 they they played rummy so i mean and, and then the customer was like oh my god all my features were based on this assumption that you know people mm. so much but after paytm and you know google pay and and these these apps completely changed the way people use um and digital products right so yeah so these kind of discoveries happen through our design thinking journey so i think yeah i, yeah, I would that. love to know in my personal interest is there a lot of like difference in kind of users skill set when you're designing apps for masses like billions of people only within the same country in india because like usually i've been like now I develop products in india but it's been a while now living in california of course i develop products for global audience but still there are certain assumptions right unless a product is solving a very niche problem how do you handle like if it's a global, like national product um yeah because there are i mean imagine a lot of personas within that itself based on how they use the smartphone the gestures and like yeah. pa- generally was like oh he's a power user this is like less power but now even that definition will evolve a lot right 
yeah 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 so uh, again uh, ethnographic research contextual inquiries a lot of ux research methods right uh, going and observing users in their natural environment can give you great insights mm-hmm. uh, than just asking them a few questions over phone right so and and contextual inquiries and ethnographic absolutely and and also doing surveys you know mm-hmm. uh, with large scale large number of people helps you validate assumptions so still there was a big difference or you were saying the difference is narrowing down which was eye opening for this particular product which you were sharing i think we'll arrive at an understanding of what our users really are mm-hmm. so the difference mm-hmm. the gap would reduce like once you do awesome. the research yeah okay okay i will take another question which from audience vishrut asks okay this is an interesting how do you feel as a in your job any example in how do you overcome that failure lots of failures <laughs> um i think uh, disastrous design has been part of my design career so <laughs> i could <laughs> talk of a lot of design disasters um you know something that looks very fancy but very toothless uh or something that looks very functional to the business but not really very delightful to the user so some something disastrous about it <laughs> we could uh, i think uh, it feels bad i feel bad when something doesn't work um uh, but yeah a lot of such examples i could go on what is closest to your heart maybe time for being little vulnerable <laughs> i think uh, one example and how do you measure the impact because usually we are always measuring like we set up the initial success metric and then go with that so how do you know that you really failed or whether it was a learning moment okay the lessons come from everywhere so mm-hmm. users teach you the uh, biggest lessons right so the moment you put your design out or the first beta version goes out and users give a lot of feedback and there is google play store rating app store rating and all of this gives you feedback so you start then looking back okay there were some things that you missed out or uh, or or an app is not making the business impact it is supposed to be making uh, so then the business stakeholders come back and say hey this looked great but it didn't work uh, so then you go back iterate uh, and keep changing your approaches and trying out that's the only way okay that sounds interesting i will jump to another question unless somia has to add something because we are kind of in last few minutes um yeah sure i think probably understanding the assumptions that you are making the usability assumptions desirability assumptions feasibility assumptions are easiest for you to check but viability assumptions as well being you make you assume that the user wants to do a job but is that the biggest pain job for them right that was some places where we there was been uh, we spent about an year year and half building along with the entrepreneur and figured no way that's not the biggest pain for the user There's something else is this is not something that will help them write a check so some of those i think are where there have been lessons for me okay one question from audience is uh, someone is a mechanical product designer and is learning product management design thinking and also pursuing mba a wow, lot of things and doing data science and ai and ml like wow you are <laughs> you're like you, you are like all excepin together so he's asking can you provide some tricks what approaches can help to take a transition to product management role okay maybe i can also share but if you guys want to share with the asomia so he is like doing data science product management design thinking firstly i would really question why are you doing so many things are you doing your own startup then yes but usually like my thinking is really focus on some few things right De- depending on your area of interest your strengths don't worry too much about your weaknesses in early career um yeah but anyways maybe uh, like people are different so i'll respect that um i think if you can think of commercializing an idea very well um uh, i think you can land a good product management role um and and if you can uh, also pick up uh, ux or user experience customer experience skills i think uh, you can enter a product management career well 
And Samia, from your experience, your personal story, what would you suggest? Because from my thinking, it's like there is like, I have met so many PMs. Like I was also not a born PM. I was a software engineer. Then I was in strategic consulting, then moved to product management. Most of the people are like that because the function was not that popular many years ago. And usually it's like, okay, you don't know what is like as a product manager. Only some companies take as RPMs or APMs. Usually people have done something similar and then maybe they build the domain experience and they they become product managers so usually it's like a jungle gym kind of a career path not like a straight linear path but um and but now because there are like some schools are also offering product management degrees so people are directly coming i'm seeing that but i think it's fun and more success kind of uh most you can have more success if you're having some background, you can empathize better with your own XFN team. But yeah, Somi, I was giving you some time to think. <laughs> so <laughs> looking for your answer now. <laughs> I think Mukesh probably has an advantage of being a polymath. Um, probably knows a little bit of everything. Um, mm -hmm. What With that a bit, a bit of everything, but you have to build the depth in product yes. management. And I think uh, one of the best ways is really what Institute of Product Leadership seems to be doing well. And we hire quite a bit of people from such institutes who've done product management courses because we need a lot of product managers and we don't look, wait for experienced guys. Uh, but doing a, cert, a structured certification of some kind and building a lot of mm. case studies and being able to participate in an interview where you are able to tear down a product and really articulate uh, go and understand the depth of end user and you're able to articulate value uh, there definitely are there's a market for that yeah yeah let me go through some questions uh deep uh, okay Pankaj, yes, uh, you can, a product designer can make a good product manager. I can say yes to that, if, given all the other things you have, analytical mindset. Deepa is asking a fun question. I also would love to know from a designer's mindset, how do you handle conflicts with your colleagues when you're actually handling ground level requirement? And also, I would put another twist to this. How do you handle conflicts with product managers? <laughs> um... Okay, well, so you're going to expect this is a high conflict role where a yes. bunch of aggressive, highly opinionated uh, people are going to come together. Um, but if we can find common ground, right, and if we can steer conversations uh, towards what is the right thing to do for the product, not who's being right, uh, I think that's, that's the key to steering conversations uh, and, and, and keep the ego aside, right? Like, Ego doesn't work at all. Tamia, any light on this? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, yeah. half of the role is about that aligning people. Maybe you have the best design, but what if the engineer doesn't feel like, oh, I don't think it's compelling enough. PM doesn't agree that it's going to make a move. So how do you align people? And give me an example of a conflict that that is close to your heart, maybe, that you haven't been, like, that was a maybe a big learning lesson. Um, I think I can tell more from my recent experience. Uh, we were designing a data visualization product for a retail analytics company. Um, and then they, they just said, hey, we have to get this to market quickly. Don't get too fancy about it. Give me a bunch of mm -hmm. charts and get done with it, right? And uh, we from the product design and the product designer background, product management background are trying to say, yes, we'll give you the charts, but what is the end user going to do with the charts? The charts are either, they're going to look at it to get an insight or they're going to take that insight and do an action, right? Otherwise charts by themselves are useless. So we were trying to say, bring in some actionable insights into your product, right? So you're looking at a chart and you're saying, hey, you've not seen the brand perform, get its buy box in Amazon the last two, three days, and you should probably reduce the price, right? Give him that next anchor of whatever to do. So there was pushback from the stakeholders and entrepreneurs saying, too much work you're giving us, just give us a chart, right? And we said, okay, if there are just patterns and if there are just three patterns of insights for you, how long will it take for you to get me to those patterns, simple patterns? And we seeded them with two, three ideas. They said, Ah, so it's just a pattern. Uh, so it just takes us a few hours to get that. And then you're able to drive that to, 
really adds value for insights for people. And they're going to use your product more because now they got that action done. They see value and advantage from using the product and then move on, right? And once they understood, like Vidya said again, that common ground is they want to be successful. We want to be successful. You're able Absolutely. to align them to say you're more successful because your product is helping the end user do more than what you know it's currently doing. Uh, they, that helps them, right? So you start with a strong underlying everything that you guys agree on and take it from there. Yeah. Sounds good. I, I, I think um, that's a really good one. Who was saying something? Did I interrupt somebody? I was I was going to add that uh, whenever I go to the tech guys saying, hey, can we have a dynamic homepage that changes if the user is coming first time and then there's a different one if it's if the user is coming second time and the third time, the tech guys is like, oh, please don't complicate this. <laughs> <laughs> I love your expressions. <laughs> yeah. so please don't make our lives harder. So uh, I think... Uh, we can do overthinking. A lot of designers get into the overthinking mode. And yeah. Yeah, it started again. That was okay. a glitch from our end. So uh, because uh, this, uh, we are exceeding the time and in the view of time constraints, we'll end up the Q&A here. And uh, thank you so much for joining in. And it was really an interactive session. And the best part for our attendees tonight was the best question asked. So, Surbi, Soumya, and Vidya, can you just uh, select one name for the best question asked today? Okay, we need to align here, Soumya, Vidya. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I really, let, let me quickly go through the questions. I like the failure question. I think, yeah, I'll take pick that. I, I would pick Mukesh Kumar's question on, can you explain the relationship between systems thinking and product design management? I think that's a topic we didn't touch upon much, but uh, it's it's kind of trending and hot. Uh, without systems thinking, you can't build sustainable products. Uh, so I that, I, I'll go with uh, Vidya. Yeah, let's okay. go with that. I didn't read that question. I was only going through the questions that we okay. took. So congratulations, Mukesh. And our team will get in touch to you very soon. And it was really a very insightful and uh, very engaging session. For me also, it was a very engaging session. So thank you so much. And uh, we really enjoyed having you with us. And it was a complete pleasure. And uh, please uh, accept the certificate of appreciation from our end. Uh, the QR code on the certificate uh, will dedicate uh, will direct you to the dedicated Hall of Fame page and the recording of the session. So we have your certificate, Surbi. That's okay, your certificate. Okay, thank you. Vidya and, and our moderator. Thank you, Pragya, and thank everyone for the great question. Hey, um, Pragya, I missed the certificate uh, just a second, yeah. Yeah, we'll send you on your email ID. Okay, this is, okay, okay, this one. Okay, yeah, thank we'll, you. We'll send you on your email ID, and thank you, audience, for being very consistent, asking the right questions, and it was really a complete pleasure for me also, and uh, for our audience as well, and do share your experiences on our website and uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, everywhere. But it was really a complete pleasure. Seriously. Yeah, thanks, Vidya and uh, Samia for being vulnerable and open and Pragya for organizing. Yeah, it was thanks, a great Alex. session and actually learned a lot from Vidya and you, Surbhi, too. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Likewise, and thank you for inviting us. Uh, great learning and wonderful questions. Looking forward for uh, 